Chapter 23, The United States and the Cold War, 1945 to 1953, Part 3 and 4. Part 3. After the war, President Truman faced the monumental task of shifting America from war to peace. The more than 12 million men still in the military in 1945 wanted to return to their families and jobs, and demobilization occurred rapidly. While some veterans found civilian life difficult, others used GI Bill benefits to build or buy homes, start small businesses, and go to college. Most veterans went into the labor force, taking jobs from more than 2 million women workers. The government dismantled wartime agencies that regulated industry and labor and set price controls which sparked immediate inflation. Backed by Democratic liberals and unions, Truman, in 1945, tried to revive the New Deal politics with a program he eventually called the Fair Deal. This would improve the social safety net and raise living standards. Truman pressed Congress to hike the minimum wage, create a national health insurance system, and increase public housing, social security, and educational aid. The year 1946 was one of labor revolt. The AFL and CIO launched Operation Dixie to bring unions to the South and end the anti-labor conservatism of Southern policies, sending hundreds of labor organizations into the region's textile mills, steel factories, and fields. With no more overtime work for war production and skyrocketing inflation caused by the end of price controls, workers' real income dropped sharply. Workers responded by going on strike to demand wage raises. Five million of them. 750,000 steel workers conducted the largest single strike in U.S. history up to that point. The strike wave alarmed President Truman, who became hostile to the unions and won an injunction to force striking coal miners back to work. In the 1946 elections, middle-class voters scared by labor unrest voted Republican and many workers angry at Truman's policies just stayed at home. The Democrats lost both houses of Congress to the Republicans for the first time since 1920. Operation Dixie capitulated to the opposition of Southern employers and white workers' racism, keeping intact Southern political power in Washington. The 1946 election secured the continuing domination of the Congress by a coalition of conservative Southern Democrats and Republicans. President Truman, in his first term, embraced civil rights for African Americans, departing from Roosevelt's administration's relative lack of concern. The war against Nazism and its radical racial theories had raised black militants and consciousness about the plight of black Americans. Many states established fair employment practices commissions and cities passed laws to end discrimination in jobs and public accommodations. A civil rights coalition of labor, religious, and black groups supported these efforts. By 1952, the NAACP had raised the number of black voters in the South to 20%, and, the, and in that year, no lynching took place, as many law enforcement agencies started to crack down on the practice. Sports started to desegregate after the Brooklyn Dodgers in 1947 added black athlete Jackie Robinson to their team. In 1947, a commission on civil rights appointed by Truman issued a report to secure these rights, calling on the federal government to end segregation and guarantee equal treatment in housing, employment, education, and criminal justice. The Truman administration, calling the report an American Charter of Human Freedom, hoped to deflect Cold War criticisms that America racial relations violated democracy and human rights. Though Truman soon presented a comprehensive civil rights program to Congress asking for a federal civil rights commission, anti-lynching and anti-poll tax laws, as, also, as well as laws for equal access and jobs in education, Congress rejected it. But in the summer of 1948, Truman desegregated the military, and the military became the first largely integrated institution in American history. Truman went on to help construct the most progressive Democratic platform in history for the 1948 elections, which included a robust civil rights plank. When liberals at the 1948 Democratic Convention passed the civil rights plank, many Southern delegates walked out. These so-called Dixiecrats soon formed the state's rights Democratic Party and nominated for president Strom Thurmond, the governor of South Carolina. This party's platform called for complete segregation of the racists, and though he denied being a racist, Thurmond argued that the freedom of the states to govern themselves was imperiled. Truman also faced a second political insurgency from the left. Left-wing critics of Truman's foreign policy formed the Progressive Party and nominated Henry A. Wallace for president. Wallace proposed expanding the welfare state and denounced segregation more than Truman. 
Wallace differed most strongly from Truman over the Cold War. He called for international controls on nuclear weapons and advocated trade with the Soviet Union. Yet when Wallace welcomed the support of socialists and communists, opening the party to communist influence, liberals abandoned his candidacy. Though Wallace threatened Truman on the left and Thurman threatened him in the Democratic South, Truman's primary challenger was the uncharismatic Republican candidate Thomas A. Dewey. Truman campaigned furiously, criticized the Congress for its inaction, and recycled New Deal critiques of Wall Street and warnings that Republicans wanted to end Social Security. This election was the last before television transformed electoral policies by minimizing in-depth debate and presentations of ideology and policy. Despite a widely predicted Dewey victory, Truman won an overwhelming majority in the Electoral College. For the first time since 1868, blacks decisively influenced the outcome. Thurman carried four southern states, anticipating a later shift of these Democratic states' voters to the Republican Party. Wallace received fewer votes than Thurman, an outcome which made criticism of America's Cold War foreign policy even less acceptable. Part 4 The Cold War completely transformed American life. Society was permanently militarized. The military-industrial complex forged by World War II persisted and expanded. The U.S. retained a large and active federal government which spent billions on weapons and overseas bases. National security justified enormous government projects and expenditures, including aid to higher education and a building of a national highway system. It also made government officials secret and dishonest, leading, for example, to the covering up of nuclear, chemical, and biological weapons tests conducted on U.S. soldiers and civilians. Cold War spending fostered economic growth and scientific and technological innovation that greatly shaped civilian life in medicine, computers, aircrafts, and other products. Government research needs expanded higher education, the Cold War changed immigration policy to favor refugees from communist countries, and increased pressure on American officials to minimize segregation. And the Cold War, like World War I, created a culture which sharply differentiated the loyal from the disloyal and eroded civil liberties. In 1947, Truman created a loyalty review system in which federal employees had to prove their devotion to the Americas without knowing who was accusing them of disloyalty and on what basis. No espionage was revealed, but hundreds lost their jobs or resigned rather than be investigated. In 1947, the House Un-American Activities Committee, or HUAC, held hearings about communist influence in Hollywood. Celebrities and famous writers and directors were forced to appear before the committee or face punishment, though some, like Ronald Reagan, alleged that the entertainment industry was rife with communism. Some refused to testify, claiming that the House on american Activities Committee violated constitutional protections for free speech and political association. A group called the Hollywood Ten went to jail for contempt of Congress, and a Hollywood blacklisted them and hundreds of others who were accused of communist sympathies or who refused to identify alleged communists. Several high-profile legal cases exacerbated the anti-communist craze. Whitaker Chambers, a Time magazine editor, charged that in the 1930s, Alger Hiss, a State Department official, had given him secret documents to take to Soviet agents. Hiss denied the allegations, but was convicted for perjury and served five years in prison. The Truman administration put Communist Party leaders on trial for advocating revolution, and several were imprisoned. In 1951, Julius and Ethel Rosenberg, working-class Jewish communists from New York, were convicted of conspiring to pass secrets about the atomic bomb to the Soviets during World War II. The evidence against them was deemed too secret to be revealed at the time, but later it became clear that Julius had not given the secret of the bomb to the Soviets, and that almost no evidence supported charges against Ethel. Even though their charges were less serious than spying or treason, the judge said they had helped cause the Korean War. They were sentenced to death and executed in 1953. Whether or not Hiss or the Rosenbergs were actually guilty, their trial strengthened Americans' sense that a massive spy network in the United States endangered the nation. This climate of fear allowed an obscure Wisconsin senator to lead a spurious anti-communist crusade. In 1950, Senator Joseph R. McCarthy delivered a speech in Wheeling, West Virginia, in which he claimed to have a list of 205 communists employed at the State Department. The charge was baseless. He constantly changed the numbers, and he never identified anyone who was actually disloyal. But McCarthy used his senatorial position to hold hearings and allege disloyalty at the Defense Department and other government agencies. 
Though many Republicans embraced McCarthy's campaign as a way to damage the Truman administration, his attacks on government officials after Republican candidate Dwight D. Eisenhower was elected president in 1952 alienated Republicans. In 1954, his allegations of disloyalty in the Army led to televised hearings that exposed McCarthy's tactics and led to his downfall. The Republican Senate condemned his action, and though McCarthy died three years later, McCarthyism came to refer to the abuse of power in the name of anti-communism. Although anti-communism most affected the national government, anti-communism pervaded local government and life as well. States created committees based on HUAC to ferret out alleged communists, and state and local authorities required loyalty oaths of teachers, pharmacists, and other professionals. Private groups like the American Legion and the National Association of Manufacturers also targeted individuals for their political beliefs. Organizations that had been influenced by communists in the 1930s and 1940s became tainted, and those who would not testify about their past and present political opinions or refused to name communists often lost their jobs. Un-American books like Stories of Robin Hood were removed from local libraries. Universities refused to host left-wing speakers and fired teachers who would not take loyalty oaths. The courts did nothing to halt these violations of civil liberties, and the Supreme Court defended the imprisonment of communists for their beliefs. Though Soviet spies certainly were in the United States, the minuscule Communist Party did not endanger American security. Most of those jailed or fired in the McCarthy era were guilty of only holding unpopular beliefs and engaging in lawful political activity. Anti-communism was a popular mass movement that had its uses. One basis was in ethnic groups with roots in Eastern European countries dominated by the Soviets, like the Polish, and among American Catholics who opposed communist hostility to the region. Government agencies like the Federal Bureau of Investigation, led by J. Edgar Hoover, used anti-communism to increase their power. Anti-communism was also used for purely partisan political purposes. McCarthy and other anti-communist leaders seemed to criticize the legacy of Roosevelt and the New Deal more than Stalin and communism. Many Democrats embraced anti-communism to deflect Republican allegations of disloyalty. The Democrats excluded many in the left and the Popular Front who had helped organize support for New Deal policies. Anti-communism made conformity the new definition of loyalty and criticism of the status quo now appeared subversive. Business used anti-communism against unions, white supremacists used it against black civil rights, and others used it to defend sexual morality and traditional gender roles against feminism and homosexuality. Anti-communism, most pervasive from the late 1940s to the early 1960s, powerfully shaped American politics and culture. Republicans invoked communism to stymie Truman's political program. Truman became alarmed by excesses of anti-communism and he seemed to retreat from it in his policies in government. In 1950, he vetoed a measure that required subversive groups to register with the government, denied passports to their members, and authorized the president to deport or detain them. But Congress overrode his veto and enacted it. In 1952, a new immigration law also passed over Truman's veto, which shot down Truman's proposals for immigration reform and allowed the deportation of communists, even if they were citizens. In 1954, the federal government's Operation Wetback resulted in the military deportation of about one million Mexican Americans alleged to be illegal aliens. Truman only barely expanded the coverage of Social Security, and instead of extending federal social welfare, private welfare prevailed. Union workers' contracts provided them with health insurance, wage increases that followed the cost of living, pensions, and paid vacations, while all other workers remained covered. But only workers in the unionized heavy industries enjoyed these benefits in America. In Europe, all workers received these benefits from the government. All political and social groups had to comply with anti-communism or be destroyed, and this severely damaged the labor and civil rights movements that had benefited from dedicated communist organizers. After the 1947 passage of the Taft-Hartley Act, which withdrew bargaining rights and legal protections from unions whose leaders refused to swear that they weren't communist, the CIO expelled left-wing unions with nearly one million members. Unions began to support Cold War U.S. foreign policies. Since left-wingers were often the most militant advocates of women's rights and civil rights, their expulsion left unions unable to respond to the civil rights movement in an economy that shifted from manufacturing to service work. The civil rights movement changed. 
While major civil rights groups at first protested Truman's loyalty program and criticized anti-communists for not defining racism as un-American, nearly all black leaders and civil rights organizations were pressured into joining the anti-communist crusade. Groups like the Southern Conference for Human Welfare that had united communists and non-communists in a struggle for both racial equality and social justice disintegrated, leaving only legalistic groups like the NAACP. Black organizations adopted Cold War language to argue that segregation and racism in the U.S. gave credence to Soviet criticisms of America, and thus helped solidify Cold War understandings of freedom. In a climate of anti-communism and McCarthyism, criticisms of American policy, domestic or foreign, invited a harsh response. Truman's civil rights program faltered. But the booming economy of the 1950s, which produced an affluent society in America for the first time, produced a widening gap between white affluence and black poverty, and disenfranchisement that would help inspire a civil rights resurgence in the 1960s.